Hey, Inspired Moneymaker. Most people laugh when they hear that the secret to success is giving. And then again, most people are nowhere near as successful as they wish they were. Coming up, the co-author of the best-selling book, The Go-Giver. Episode 218 features Bob Berg, best-selling author, sales, marketing, and influence expert. Despite the negative messages about money we get from the world around us in terms of money, prosperity, abundance, business, horrible, just horribly negative messages. Despite all those, the truth is, Giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. Giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work in tandem. The key is to focus on the giving, the giving of value, and then allow the receiving. I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money podcast and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. Our guest today is Bob Bird. He's author of the sales classic, Endless Referrals, and co-author of The Go-Giver, a business book that has sold over a million copies. Bob shows entrepreneurs, leaders, and sales professionals how to communicate their value and accelerate their referral business. See if Bob can change your mindset or focus, as he has for so many people, potentially bringing exceptional results. In this episode, you'll learn ways to sell on value, not price, the power of story, whether it's on a sales call or in the Go-Giver book, a little story about a powerful business idea. And you don't want to miss the five laws of stratospheric success. Now let's get inspired with Bob Berg. Bob, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Hey, Andy, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Ah, uh, so... I think I'm probably one of the fortunate ones in that it wasn't something that was that was on my mind at a very young age. Uh, I knew for the first few years of my life, my parents were were you know not in great shape financially. I know my dad grew up very very poor in the uh, immigrant kind of um, what do you call them the the uh, tenement houses and so forth. Uh, my mom, not, not quite as, as bad as she grew uh, in terms of her growing up financially. But, uh, once I was probably four or five, uh, my parents' business started to do well. So while we weren't what you'd call wealthy, we were comfortable middle-class. So it really wasn't, uh, and there were no issues as far as I, you know, could, could see there weren't any, uh, negative talk about money. You know, you hear that so many people grow up with a money is kind of a, an evil type of thing. And, you know, if, if you, jealousy of people who were doing better, never, that, that wasn't something I experienced. Um, I also knew that many of my, my friends uh, were, you know, what would be called economically poor. And so I always kind of felt wealthier in comparison than we probably were because, you know, because of that situation. So that was relative. Um, but I just remember my parents always being very charitable and, and, you know, very kind in terms of when it came to money and so forth. So I never really had that negative emotion about it that, that a lot of people unfortunately did. Sounds like a nice mix of like a, an appreciation for money because yeah. there wasn't always an abundance, but giving also to help others what kind what type of business were your parents in well my my dad had founded a sort of gymnasium school i guess you would call it that was very psychodynamically oriented so he was really one of the first who who had the idea that if you could make a person feel comfortable physically in terms of sports self defense and so forth you could actually help them um emotionally and so he worked with a lot of uh families and, uh, and, and so there was a lot of, you know, uh, again, the physical activity, the sport self-defense, but there was also a lot of talk and there was also a lot of, so it was, it was kind of really different from, from what, uh, a, what was happening at the time. And even, even today. And, and my dad is not someone who ever, you know, got to go to college or anything. He went right from his childhood into the war and came back and he just started out basically by renting a, a one room place and giving boxing lessons. 
and it grew and grew and people kept referring their, their children. And even, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists would actually refer families to, to him. My mom really handled the business aspect of it. So the two of them, and she had a much better business mind than my dad. And so really the two of them together, you know, really built up a nice, nice business. Sounds like a good team. Did, did you grow up boxing? In that yeah, environment, I mean, it was always just part of, you know, it was always part of, of the, the, you know, the family in a sense, not, not that my mom was so happy about that aspect, but it was just something, and it was nothing my dad ever, you know, even encourages kids to do. It was just part of it. You just, you know, you, you just knew it. Uh, he, he actually, after the war, he, uh, he, for a while was the manager of, um, uh, Angelo and Chris Dundee's famous fifth street fight gym in Miami beach, which back in the day was the big, you know, uh, the gym. So, uh, there was, there was certainly a, you know, a, a background in boxing in our family. Wow. So you grew up with like surrounded by this boxing kind of <laughs> men mentality and probably some pretty good boxers around. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> so you're a best-selling author today. You're a speaker. How is it that you got your start in sales? How did you go from boxing to sales? Uh, well, I, um, was, I started out as a broadcaster, first as a sportscaster on radio and then a, as a um, uh, news guy on, on television for a very, very small ABC affiliate in the Midwestern United States, eventually working my way up to the news anchorship. But really, I wasn't very good at it. I, I certainly was not a journalist. I could read the news, but, you know, sports was really my thing and the news wasn't. And uh, I, didn't I found myself not doing that <laughs> anymore. So I got into sales basically just as a way to pay the bills. And uh, the challenge was I, I had no real experience, uh, no formal sales sales training. So I floundered for the first few months. Uh, then um, in a bookstore, this is almost 40 years ago, I, I uh, was looking for something. I didn't know what. I didn't know that there were books on sales. That, that was a totally foreign to me. I, what did I know from that? Um, and I found two books. One was uh, on sales. One was taught by Tom Hopkins, the other by Zig Ziglar, who happened to be two of the, the um, iconic salespeople you know, of, of the day. And I got their books and I started studying it. And I mean, really studying those books. And I began to apply their information. And almost immediately, my sales began to go through the roof. You know, I had a methodology. I had a, a system. I define a system as simply the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles, right? And I followed what they said. And, and then I, I really made a study of sales. And it, it, when you study sales, you're also studying personal development, which I came to really love and i just just immersed myself with with books and back then cassette tapes and going to seminars and learning everything i could eventually i was sales manager of another company and from there started teaching others how to do the same and it kind of morphed into a, a speaking career and when you speak you write and then uh you know that that's just kind of how it happened bob you've talked to a lot of sales organizations I think there are a lot of people who get into it without formal training. It, it is like you get, you get thrown into the pool and they say, swim, <laughs> figure right, it out, right. you know, pick up the phone and just call people. What did it look like this self-study, pretty intensive self-study that you're putting yourself through? And then was it a matter of seeing a concept and then trying it out? Were you just, was it like a testing ground? Yeah, well, once I got those books, uh, it really, it, it, I mean, it was self-study, but it was great guidance. I mean, they, you know, and I got, you know, every, uh, I would go to seminars, I'd get the cassette tapes. I always, I feel funny always saying cassette tapes. That's how, you know, long ago, you know, you know most people listening probably don't even know what that is, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, so no, I felt really uh, well guided by the by them, but then when I got into my next sales job after that first one, the sales manager was also a student of sales. So he sort of took me under his wing and, and helped me really kind of apply that as well and take me to a whole different level in sales. And then it seemed like I'd get another sales job and I would keep the training at, you know, continue the training aspect and the learning. So I didn't really feel like I was alone on the journey at that point. So you learn from books, you learn from people. I know that you also went to seminars, so you got to hear some of these authors who influenced you speak yeah. in person. What what are some of the like 
foundational principles that you learned and really allowed your career to excel? I think the foundational ones is understanding that selling is is really at its essence. It's it what it's not is trying to convince someone to buy something they don't want or need. That's not selling. That's called being a con artist. Uh, selling at its essence is discovering what the other person, because it's about them, it's not about us, it's discovering what the other person needs, wants, or desires, and helping them to get it. And, and that's really the key. You know, in the old English root of the word sell was salan, which meant to give. So when you're selling, you're literally giving. And someone might say, well, yeah, that sounds kind of just semantics. You know, when you're selling, you're giving. What are you giving? Well, let's say you have a prospective customer or client in front of you. You're about to present. You're in the selling process, right? What are you giving? I suggest you're giving that person time, attention, counsel, education, empathy, and ultimately immense value. Was it a very natural progression to go from salesperson to getting into the business of teaching others? And to me, it seems like really getting into the business of shifting people's perspectives. Because even now, when you tell us it's about counsel, it's about listening. For many people, for many salespeople, I think that is a pretty significant mindset shift. So I think it was more natural for me than it might be for others, because I think there, there's two things. By nature, I'm kind of a teacher. <laughs> I really enjoy that. But I also am not a fast learner. And because of that, I tend to be a more effective teacher because I have the empathy, uh, you know, that not everyone's a, a quick learner. Not, you know, you, uh, the greatest natural athletes are typically not the best coaches. They may be fantastic at what they do, but they're not able to see, you know, uh, why that person can't just pick up a bat and swing it and, and connect and why, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they say, you just swing, it's easy. Yeah, of course, right. <laughs> the best the natural scholars are not necessarily the best teachers for that same reason. Um, and so I'm a slow learner. Now, once I get something, I typically have it, but I'm not a fast learner. Because of that, I think I can, I, I teach in a way that assumes that people are as slow a learner as I am. And since most people aren't, they tend to be able to get it pretty easily and then, you know, kind of move from there building on our small successes. So tell us a little bit about, I know one of the principles that you teach people is changing your focus as a salesperson from competing on price to selling on value. Yeah. Oh, very, very important. I think sometimes it sounds easy, but how do you truly put that into practice? So first, I think it's really important that, that, that we understand the difference between price and value because the two are significantly different if, if done, if communicated correctly. Price is a dollar figure. It's a dollar amount. It's finite. It is what it is, right? Uh, value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea that brings with it so much worth or value that someone will willingly exchange their money for it and be glad they did, uh, while you, the salesperson, makes a very healthy profit. So, so a little, little, just as a, a quick example, uh, the accountant you hire to do your taxes, she charges you uh, $1,000, that's her fee or literally her price. Um, uh, but what value does she give you in exchange? Well, she, for, through her, her work, uh, through her experience, through her desire to get to know you and what you're looking to accomplish, learning your business and so forth, she's able to save you $5,000 in taxes. She saves you countless hours of time. She provides you and your family security, peace of mind, knowing it was done correctly. So what we see is that, uh, that she, she gave you well over $5,000 in value, way more than that altogether, and for in exchange for that $1,000 price. So you feel great about it. She made a very healthy profit. But, you know, so just the intrinsic value of what she did was fantastic. But here's the thing. 
most accountants should be able to do that. So while she gives more in value than she takes in payment, it, what distinguishes her from anyone else, from any other accountant? And let's face it, if a prospective customer or client cannot distinguish between any two or more accountants or realtors or insurance people or whatever it happens to be, they're always going to go with who has the lowest price. That's human nature. So we need to be able to, to distinguish ourselves. And because again, uh, you know, if they're, if they're buying on lowest price, so, you know, it, uh, because they can't see a difference. Well, if, if you're trying to make low price, your unique value proposition, unless your last name is Walmart or, or amazon.com, you're in trouble. It's not a productive way to do business. It's not, it's not fulfilling, it's not profitable, and it's not sustainable. When you sell on low price, you're a commodity. When you sell on high value, you're a resource. So the key is to be able to position yourself as distinct, as different, as, as desirable to that other person. Well, it begins with you. You become that additional value. Understanding that people buy you before they buy your company, before they buy your product or service. So now the question is, well, how do you do that? Right, especially if your if your product or service is basically a commodity, how do you you know um, uh, communicate that? Well, fortunately, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of ways to communicate that additional value, but they tend to come down to five what we call elements of value, and those elements of value are excellence, consistency, attention, empathy, and appreciation. And to the degree that you are able to communicate one or more, hopefully all five of those elements of value at every single touch point from the, the, the moment you meet that person, whether it's inbound or outbound, whether it's at an event somewhere, whether uh, and, and, and through the relationship building process, the follow up and the follow through and the sales process and the referral to the degree that you communicate those elements of value, that is the degree that you take low price and your competition out of the picture. Do you find that technology, because the internet makes price comparison so easy for everybody, I feel like there's a tendency for the consumer to get overly focused on price. Sure, yeah, well, at first they often will. Uh, and uh, what that means is that you've got to communicate why price isn't the major issue and why it shouldn't be. And typically it isn't. You know, unless it is just a it's totally a commodity that there really does need, but then there doesn't need to be salespeople. You know, uh, you can put a computer up there and let people just, you know, what have you. But that's not typically what it is. Value is still the key driver. It's, it's what that other person values, though. And not everybody values the same thing. Remember, we said it's the relative worth or desirability of a thing, which means value is always in the eyes of the beholder. So what is it that that other person finds to be a value? And that's what we need to focus on. So when you're working with a customer, is that the heart of it? Is that what you're trying to understand? Like, what is their motivation? Sure. What is, what, how do they define value? Because ultimately yeah. it seems like you have some power to kind of craft or mold someone's perceived value. You want to make sure that they recognize the value, but you have to, you have to know how they define value too, right? Like what's important to them. Absolutely. That's a big buzz. That's a big puzzle. Um, you just, you hit it totally right on the head. Absolutely. And there's only one way we can really know, and that's by asking and then listening. Because as human beings, we all see the world through our own set of personal beliefs, what I call our unconscious operating system. You know, this is a combination of upbringing, environment, schooling, news media, television, the internet, you know, everything. But it, it tends to, just like our feelings about money, they often tend to be... Um, pretty settled by the time we're a little more than toddlers because of the beliefs that are handed to us, right? That we don't have the, uh, at this point, the knowledge to be able to either refute or to question or, or what have you. So we, but we assume that people see the world mostly the same way we do. 
And that can be very dangerous for a salesperson. I often use the, you know, the, the story of the, the um, realtor who is showing someone a home and they take them through the living room and the realtor says, oh, and you know what I love most about this living room? And of course, who cares? what they love most about the living room. It's what the other person loves most about the living room or anything else they find important. So we need to be able to ask questions and then listen and really listen. As Stephen Covey used to say, listen to understand. And, and that's a, you know, that's a skill set. That's something we need to be able to really take the focus off of ourself and place it on that other person. Listening is not always the easiest thing to do. Right. <laughs> Not very natural sometimes, is it? No, even when we think that we're getting better at it and we do work mm -hmm. at it, mm -hmm. um, especially when we're doing a, a recording like this, you go back and you listen to the tape and you say, I missed that the first first time, second time. Well, actually, you're a great interviewer. You ask fantastic questions and that's, you know, that's so very important. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I think with when it comes to sales training, like, yeah. Like salespeople are always striving for tactics. It's like, what sales tactics can I employ that are going to improve the bottom line? How am I going to close more sales? And I wanted to talk to you about your book, The Go-Giver, because it's a parable and it's not really tactical focused. Like, yeah. how is it that you decided to write this book as a parable? that can be applied to salesmanship. And what, what really hits me is that so, so many, so many business leaders say that it's one of the most impactful influences on their business. Wow. Uh, well, thank you. And it, the, I guess the inspiration for it was 20 years earlier, back in the nineties, my first book that came out was um, Endless Referrals. Uh, the subtitle is Network Your Everyday Contacts into Sales. That was a how-to book. Um, so there were uh, so there were what I call principles, strategies, and tactics. Most important are principles, and of course, and then strategies. Uh, tactics come and go. <laughs> tactics should always be utilized, by the way. I, I almost you know don't even like the word tactics because it almost sounds negative, but it's not if they're used in accordance with principles righteous principles and solid strategies, right? Um, but they, you know, they, they uh, tactics change all the time, strategies not as much so, but they sure, certainly change principles always remain, you know, the same, that's why they're principles. Uh, and so this was a book, a how-to book for entrepreneurs and salespeople who knew they had a great product or service. They knew it brought lots of value to those they served, but they didn't necessarily feel comfortable or confident going out into their local communities and uh, establishing and building the kinds of relationships where people would wanna do business with them and refer them to others. So the book was really on how to create, uh, well, the basic premise was that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know like and trust that also showed up in, in the go-giver right but that was the basic premise and the book was on how to create those and, and build those those sustainable relationships um but i'd always loved reading business parables because parables are stories and stories tend to connect on a much deeper heart to heart level and i thought wouldn't it be great if we could take that basic no like and trust premise and put it into a parable and uh, at first i just asked the question well so what is the basic essence of those salespeople who are able to quickly and sustainably create those no like and trust relationships? And it's that they're givers. They authentically, they genuinely want to give value to others. So coming up with the title, The Go-Giver, pretty easy. The best thing I did for that book, though, for the parable that would soon be written is asking John David Mann uh, to be the co-author and lead writer and storyteller. Because I'm a how-to guy. You can tell that when you speak with me for about a minute. Uh, John is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant writer. In fact, he's co-authored numerous New York Times bestseller books, selling books on all sorts of topics. He's just, he's brilliant. And fortunately, John said yes to doing that. And we, you know, put that together and, and wrote The Go-Giver together. And so, uh, but it was his writing that really, you know, made the, made the parable work that, that brought it to life. How did you initially find John? How did the partnership happen? 
Yeah, well, he was the editor in chief of a magazine I was writing uh, a, a monthly column for, and he was such a great editor. But it was the way he did it too that he was always very kind, very humble. You know, he'd send it back to me and say, you know, I I changed this here, I put this here, I you know left this out, I put this, which you know they don't have to do as editors; they could pretty much have free reign to to do it. But he he never did it like that. He was always very very thoughtful about it. And the running joke was every week I'd write him, I'd email him back and say, John, not only is it okay, because uh, he'd always say, is this okay? I'd say, not only is this okay, uh, you write my stuff better than I write my stuff. And at the time, he wasn't as well known. He was no well known in his his particular marketplace, but that was it. Uh, now he's sort of like the the golden boy. He's the guy who, when a, a publisher or an agent has a celebrity or a CEO or an athlete that they want to write a book, John's the guy they call. Will you write the book with him? But back then, very few people knew of him. Fortunately, I was one of them who did. So I had asked, uh, you know, I, so I'd reached out. He was the only one I wanted to write this with. I just knew that he, you know, he would just bring this to life and, you know, as he did. And uh, so that, you know, and even then he, he was still busy with what he was doing. His his fiance, Anna, now his, his wife of now 12 years, I think, Anna, they were, they were down visiting her uh, mom across the state uh, from me on the Gulf Coast of Florida. I'm in Jupiter, Florida, on the East Coast. And they drove over. They took the four-hour drive one day, they, and we had about a three-hour dinner discussing the, the idea of the book, what it would be about, how we would want to market it, and the, you know, just everything that, that, you, that you should have a conversation about if you're going to write a book together. And, uh, and it was even a few weeks later before he called me and said, yeah, you know, I think we've got something here. So it, it took a few months to write it up. The tough part was finding the publisher. We went through, I think, 24 rejections over the course of a year before the 25th one, uh, Penguin, uh, or actually uh, Portfolio, an imprint of Penguin Random House, uh, finally said yes. And they've been the, just the perfect publishing partner. When you were having those initial discussions about the concept and about marketing mm -hmm. this book, did you know that it could become a movement I think we 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 both truly felt and believed that there would be a market for it and that it would be well received. I think we we believe that. I don't know that you can really predict that something is going to get that big. Um so I, I can't say for sure, you know, in hindsight, you know, we can say, but I, I can't say that. I, and I always, you know, I always go into anything thinking it's going to work. Otherwise, why would you, you do it? But I, but I, you know, want to really be able to respect that, you know, the, the process of it. And I, and, and I can't say that I knew it was going to be as big as it became. Uh, I think John and I both feel very fortunate that so many people just from the beginning took hold of it and started sharing it with others and telling others about it that, you know, it kind of did grow into a, into a movement. How do you turn a book into a movement? Because it's, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the read. There are many valuable takeaways, but it's very digestible. Like I could read 125, 130 pages very quickly, but how do you turn that into something that like you've, you've built an entire career around it, speaking, consulting with companies, and writing more books um, follow as follow ups. Yeah, that you know, uh, another great question. Man, you're you're good. Um, you know, I think what you do is you you can you control what you can control, and you you make sure you're not attached to the results and what you cannot control. So what we could control is putting the best book together we could. What we could control is doing the marketing for it. I mean, I've been doing interviews on this since the book first came out. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the blog, the guest blogs, the guest, you know, podcast, the guest, anything I could, the speaking that I did, you know, since then was always on, you know, was on this topic. Everything that, that I've done, uh, and John, of course, has been a huge help, but again, John's a professional writer, so he's on a lot of projects, you know, so he can't always devote himself just to, to this. Um, you know, that's really my job to do that. And, and that's really just what I've tried to do. And that's what I can control. I can control how much I can put word out there to keep the book going and to expose as many people to it as I possibly can. And then it's a matter of do people get behind it. And fortunately they have. 
Well, I love the pillars of the five laws of stratospheric success. I, I can't imagine anyone not wanting to know <laughs> what those five laws are. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Can you highlight, like, sure. either highlight one of the laws that you think is really important, or, or maybe you can even think to your sales training and if there's an example of somebody who has employed or represents one of these laws oh, well, so there's, strongly. Yeah, there's, there's lots of those. I'll, I'll just do a Reader's Digest version of them. And uh, the, the laws themselves are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. Uh, law number one, the law of value, uh, says your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. We discussed that already. It's that 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 it's the, it's the accountant who gives well over five thousand dollars of value in exchange for a thousand dollars. But remember, uh, you know that thousand dollars was well worth her time to do that because to her it was uh, you know a, a great trade off, right? She gave well over five thousand dollars in value. But it was worth it to her to lease out her time, her energy, her knowledge, her wisdom, her caring in order to, to do that. So in any market-based exchange, okay, there should always be two profits, the buyer profits and the seller profits, because each of them come away much better off afterwards than they were beforehand. But it's always the result of the focus being not on the money, but on the value you're providing. That's why John and I say that money is simply an echo of value. It's the thunder, if you will, to values lightning. The money comes, I mean, the value comes first. The money you receive is a natural result of the value you provide. Law number two, the law of compensation says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says, give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us the more people whose lives we touch or impact with that exceptional value, the more money with which we'll be rewarded. So it's scalable. Number, scalable, exactly. Law number three is the law of uh, influence, which says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Not in a way that's doormatty or self-sacrificial or martyrish. No, no. It's simply understanding, as we talked about earlier, that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Well, here's the thing. There's no faster, more powerful way to elicit those feelings toward you from others than by genuinely moving from an I focus or me focus to an other focus. Looking to, as Sam, one of the mentors in the story, advised Joe, make your win all about the other person's win. Law number four, the law of authenticity says the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. In this part of the story, Deborah uh, Davenport uh, shared a very important lesson, and that is all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills, even all those tactics, right? As important as they are, and they are important, but they're also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core. But when you do, when you show up as yourself, people feel good about you. People uh, feel comfortable with you. People feel safe with you. Why wouldn't they? They know who they're getting. And that's when the magic really happens. And then law number five is the law of receptivity, uh, which says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. You know, this is really your wheelhouse when it comes to, you know, to the financial aspect. And that's understanding that, you know, that, yeah, you breathe out, but you also have to breathe in. It's not one or the other. It's both. You breathe out carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen. You breathe out, which is giving, you breathe in, which is receiving. And despite the negative messages about money we get from the world around us, and we are, I mean, the messages from the world around us in terms of money, prosperity, abundance, business, horrible, just horribly negative messages. Despite all those, the truth is giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. Giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work in tandem. The key is to focus on the giving, the giving of value, and then allow the receiving. I, I, I'm thinking that number four and five may be the most difficult for many people. 
Number four, because I think many of us don't think of ourselves as the unique piece of the equation. And it requires you to know yourself and really oh. take some time to know your strengths, know your weaknesses, and then lean into that. Oh, uh, my, you, you just, uh, you right on, you know, that, that is, and, and we always say, you know, the, the reason why people don't show up authentically is not for any nefarious reasons, not, you know, not usually there are always those people out there, but no, most of the time when someone doesn't show up authentically, it's simply because they don't have the self-confidence to do so. They really don't recognize and embrace their strengths, their, their, the value they, they bring to the table. You know, I think, I think as human beings, we have two types of value. We have intrinsic value, which is simply just by being here, we bring value to the table. But we also have what I call market value. And I define market value as that combination of strengths, traits, talents, and characteristics that allow a person to add value to others, individuals and the marketplace as a whole, in such a way that they will be rewarded financially. We all have these, these assets of value. But what happens is, what's tough is that we're, as human beings, we're so emotionally close to ourselves, it can be difficult for us to really recognize those because we think that what we can do well, well, anybody can do well. Remember, we see the world from our own unique belief system and we believe everyone else kind of sees it the same way we do or has. So that's why when we don't really embrace those strengths, that's when we we undersell when we sell on too low a price. We don't place enough value on us and what we bring to the table, which is why it's very, very important to often have someone, whether it's a coach or a mentor or what have you, who can help you really recognize that greatness that you bring to the table. And whether it's, whether it's one kind of unique, amazing strength or talent, whatever, or if it's like most of us who don't excel in any particular strength in particular, but as Scott Adams, the creator of the Dilbert comic strip calls it the talent stack. We have a number of different talents that we're pretty good at that we can combine in order to really bring immense value to others. You mentioned a coach or a mentor. So it sounds like to get a, an outside perspective, can be very helpful. Are there other exercises or things that you help take people through so that they can identify like what among their talent stack makes them different and stand out? Well, I personally don't really do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. So that's not something I generally do, but, but what you said is exactly right. When you are coaching someone, uh, you, you do go through a series of exercises with them to help them identify what those strengths are. And that's a matter of working with that person one-on-one -on -one and really helping them to see what they bring to the table. You know, we all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. Some weaknesses we can ignore. Some we need to mitigate. Some we need to turn into strengths. But those strengths that we really do possess, that's we, we lead from those strengths. Yeah, I think at the outset, you know, especially early in one's career, there is imposter syndrome. You are learning too. So there's an element of fake it until you make it. So when you're in that process, oftentimes you're just trying to emulate somebody else. It's not quite your authentic self yet. You're not there, but you're, you're, you're trying to, all right, I like what this person's doing. I'm going to imitate that as best I can. Um, well, I think emulate's fine. I, I wouldn't imitate, but I would emulate. Um, you know, learn from others, of course. Uh, I mean, you know, authenticity doesn't mean that you just don't grow. <laughs> you know, authenticity means you're always looking to grow into your true authentic self. I think really, you know, people misunderstand authenticity as being, well, just say whatever you want and there's no very, and, and you know, you're just, this is who I am, take it or leave it. And, uh, you know, I don't think that's a great life strategy unless you don't want to have any friends or good relationships or make any money. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, it's sort of like the person who says, well, I have anger issues and I yell at people a lot. And if I were to act any differently, that wouldn't be authentic of me. And I would say that's baloney. That's hogwash. It simply means that person has an authentic problem that they need to authentically work on in order to step into their highest version 
of their authentic self. I think authenticity is nothing more than at living and acting congruently with your values. And one of those values, hopefully, is to continue to grow and to improve upon ourselves and to become that, you know, ultimate version of our authentic self. It's very much a moving target, that's for sure. In your book, I, I something stood out to me. And um, you wrote, each of us in our lives has a natural sphere of influence of about 250 people. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, that just means that, you know, that we all know people directly and indirectly uh, from immediate family, distant relatives, close friends, sometimes acquaintances, the person who delivers the mail, the plumber, the tailor, the person who cuts our hair, as well as, you know, some of the people on uh, on social media and, you know, and, and so forth. And, and we probably know directly or indirectly about 250, 300 people, probably more now with social media where we actually do get to know some of those people and so forth. It just means that, that every time we build a relationship with one new person, uh, we, we realize that they also know directly or indirectly about 250 people. So every time we build a new relationship with someone who comes to know us, like us, and trust us, we've actually expanded our own sphere of influence by a potential 250 or more people every single time. You know, do that with enough new people on an ongoing everyday basis, and uh, pretty soon you'll be operating from an enormous uh, sphere of influence yourself. You speak a lot about uh, ref referral sales and the sphere of influence, should we be trying to grow that? My question is like qu quantity over quality. Like what's the goal? Um, are we thinking about trying to develop more contacts, quality contacts, uh, both? Uh, again, I don't think it's an either or. I think it begins with quality, right? But I, I think, but, you know, just like with the law of value, you know, you can serve one person wonderfully well, you know, your value determines your, your potential income, but it's only when you touch the lives of a number of people that your income is going to grow. So I think you begin with quality, focus on the quality of each relationship, but understand that it's also a matter of building a number of relationships. So uh, I'd say place quality over quantity and eventually you'll, you'll find you have a quantity of quality relationships. And talk a little bit more about this uh, center of influence or creating influence and how technology fits in there. Because I, I feel like the, some of the tools that are available today different from those in the past. So does influence change or is it the same thing? No, I mean, I think technology has really allowed us to reach out to people that we never would have had a chance to reach out to and develop those relationships with. And you can develop wonderful relationships online. Uh, you know, back in the day, we used to do that through a different type of technology without ever seeing someone face to face. It was called the telephone. So, you know, we can we can do that through, you know, online. We can do that through social media platforms. Again, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's 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 both. The key is when you develop relationships online is to always remember people don't do business with and refer business to those computers they know, like, and trust, but to the person, but the person sitting at that computer. So regardless of whatever you tweet or post or pin or whatever you want to call it, depending upon the platform itself, the, you just need to always ask yourself is what I'm about to, to click send on, is it likely to add value to another person's life? And what do you think about technology becomes a tremendous tool to reach more people? Uh, I think one can scale communication easier. Should the end goal still be to have a face-to-face -face meeting? Um, you know, all things being equal, sure, face-to-face -face is always best. But we're not always in a position when we can do that. You know, when I first started in sales, I had, not when I first started, I think it was my second job, I had to be on the telephone a lot and I had to build relationships on the telephone and I had to complete sales on the telephone and I had to attain referrals on the telephone. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it just, you do the best you can with what you've got, but you know, sure, whenever we can, that's always the, uh, that's always the optimum. So you've worked with many people, those who have read your books and then you've spoken to big audiences when you can 
help someone to transform what they do, uh, to be more successful at what they do. How does that make you feel? It's one of the greatest feelings I can ever imagine. I'm very, very fortunate to have the job I have. <laughs> Anything that you would do differently in your career? Oh, sure. Lots. <laughs> I, you know, I always love when people say, I wouldn't do a thing different in my life or my career. I do a ton of things different in my life and my career. If I had, you know, if I had a, had a way of, of knowing, uh, being able to go back and do it again. But since we don't, you know, all we can do is, is build upon the mistakes and the successes and the more mistakes and so forth that we've, that we've had and made and, and, you know, do the best we can to grow. In the go-giver, it's a lot of giving um, sort of within one's sales role, I think. Um, I don't recall, and maybe it's in there, uh, the idea of charity and charitable giving. Because I saw that there are charities that you're very involved in. Uh, how does that fit in? When we speak about being a go-giver, we're not really talking about charities. Um I, you know, charity is certainly a very high value in my life. I hope it is in everybody's life. Um, but that's a, you know, it's just, it's a different, different thing. We're talking more in the concept of business, uh, in, in terms of understanding the importance of having a focus on giving value, uh, to those that you're working with and why that's not only, uh, the most fulfilling way of conducting business, but actually the most financially profitable way as well. So we, we, again, certainly hope you know, people see charity as a really high value. That's just not what we're talking about in terms of the book. Yeah, you mentioned at the start of our conversation that your parents did instill that in you. You saw how they gave back uh, to the community in different causes. What are the causes that are most important to you today? Um, well, I, I'm involved with several animal charities. That's my That's my passion. So... That is, uh, that's pretty much where I devote the time and most, uh, you know, resources that I give. I saw the Furry Friends Adoption and Clinic. Yeah, that is one. There's also a, a, a woman in India who, who takes it upon herself to feed the street dogs of, of, uh, and cats of, of her city in India. And, uh, which I think is just so amazing what she's doing. How did you even learn about her organization? Uh, through Twitter. Social media. Yeah, social media. Exactly. Bob, I'd like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Uh, I would define success as a uh, uh, an ongoing sense of happiness and peace of mind, the result of knowing that you've, uh, that you've done your best. You know, and I mean, that's, that's really all you can do. That's, that's success. I mean, hey, success can be measured many different ways, right? I mean, success on a very basic level can be measured that you attained a certain result. Success can be, you know, you wanted to lose 20 pounds and you did it, you know, in a certain period of time. That's success. Success can be, mean that, you know, your team uh, beat the other team, <laughs> right? That's success. Yet that team who lost, maybe they weren't successful in terms of the win, but maybe they played above their potential or, you know, according up to their, their potential. So there's many ways to, to succeed, even if you didn't get the win. Uh, I always enjoyed uh, Earl Nightingale's uh, definition of success, the progressive realization of a worthy uh, deal, uh, worthy ideal or dream. So to him, the progressive realization was a success in and of itself. You were getting closer to that which you desired. So, you know, mine is more that, that feeling of joy and peace of mind based on having done your best to, to live up to your potential. Keep trying one's best. You can't ask for any more than that. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much for your time and sharing with us your story, the Reader's Digest version of the five laws <laughs> of stratospheric success. <laughs> Always good to get a nice summary from the source. And I, I, I do like your money as an echo of value as well. Can you tell the Inspired Money listener and viewers where to find out more and where to follow you? Yeah, best place is Berg, B-U-R-G. I like to keep things simple, dot com. So uh, Berg, B-U-R-G dot com, and they can scroll down the page and uh, get chap you know chapters of any of the books that they'd like and see some of the other resources we have. 
Fantastic. I'll put that all in the show notes. And thanks so much, Bob. Thank you. Appreciate you very much. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? For me, I loved hearing about ways to sell on value and not price. Of course, the power of genuinely giving and helping people. It can come back to you in unexpected but very significant ways. For homework, I want you to think about ways that you can give. How can you put others' interests before your own? And really, really mean it. Let me know what happens. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, let me know by posting a comment below. Thank you so much for watching to the end. I want to invite you to subscribe to my email that goes out every two weeks. The Running Meat Investment Team highlights data, news, and events that we think are worth sharing. Subscribe at inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. It's free and informative. Thank you so much for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens. <laughs>